West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Joining us now is Fintan O'Toole, columnist and writer for the Irish Times. He is the visiting professor in Irish letters at Princeton University. His brilliant essay in The Atlantic is titled, Beware Prophecies of Civil War. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Let's go straight to the title of what should we beware in prophecies of civil war? I think, uh, Lawrence, what we should be afraid of is that, of course, there are in America an awful lot of people who've been fantasizing about civil war for a long time. Uh, you know, the, the far right in America has had this narrative going um, really for decades now that, oh, America is really already in a civil war. Um, this apocalyptic rhetoric really is very much part of their DNA. And they've been ramping it up. You know, we, we, we saw this, of course, on, on, on January 6th. And the reason that they like to talk of civil war, of course, is that it seems to validate the idea that you're no longer in a democratic contest between people who have different points of view. You're actually in an existential struggle. So all the sort of niceties of democracy can be laid aside. And really, you just have to prepare to hit them before they hit you. Because if you're in a civil war or you know a civil war is coming, the logic really is that uh, you should strike first. And that, that, that rhetoric is, is already there. And it's, I, I just think those of us who believe in American democracy, believe in the Republic, should be just very cautious and careful about feeding it. Uh, I, the phrase civil war itself, to me, uh, seems to be being used rather loosely. Uh, we never considered it a civil war in Northern Ireland. We didn't consider it a civil war in 1969 through 1970 when there were hundreds of bombings. I'm going to say that number again because most people under a certain age don't know this. Hundreds of bombings against the federal government uh, in the United States uh, to protest the Vietnam War. These were bombs set off at post offices in the middle of the night. Uh, very few of them injured uh, people. Uh, some of them did kill some people, including the people who were setting off the bombs. Uh, but, but that kind of condition in these new books is being described, or things like it, being described as civil wars. I, I strongly agree with you, Lawrence. You know, I, I, I think it's almost like we're setting up a kind of a false argument, like that it's either civil war or everything is nice and rosy in the garden. You know? And the horrible thing, and, and, and we know this so well from Ireland, is that actually, you know, you, you can have something that's not civil war, but is still pretty obscene and pretty terrible, you know, and is a kind of, well, what one unfortunate British um, government minister once called an acceptable level of violence. You know, he was talking about Northern Ireland. No level of violence should be acceptable. But, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. There, there have been 
many periods in American history, other than the Civil War itself, you know, where many people would have told you that they were experiencing conditions in their own communities, particularly a lot of African-American communities, for example. You know, if we think about the burning down of the, the black districts of Tulsa, just to take one example, I mean, was that a civil war? Well, no, it wasn't, but but it's it's pretty horrific, you know, and th 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 there is an, a level of endemic political violence in, in the US for from, from the right and sometimes, as you said, from the left, um, which, which, you know, has to be taken very, very seriously. We have to understand the amount of suffering it causes. But I think calling it a civil war and then projecting that into an imaginary future and saying that America's set for a civil war, it seems to me somehow misses the point that a lot of this stuff has been around for a long time, but also misses the point that actually thinking about the imaginary future can distract you from thinking about some of the stuff that's staring you right in the face right now, which is which is insurrection and, and, and how you deal with it. Uh, there's been some political science analysis brought to this, including a score that Professor Walter uses in her book about ranking democracies. Uh, I find it odd that the United States ever could have had a perfect score as a democracy, given that it has the United States Senate, which is a fundamentally anti-democratic creation with two senators per state. But OK, uh, let's pretend it was once a perfect democracy and it has descended. Uh, that creates the notion that the United States is now descending from perfect democracy into something else where uh, that, that could become civil war. The question I had for uh, Stephen Marsh, and I, I ran out of time to ask Professor Walter, was what is the richest country, the richest country we have ever seen fall into civil war? And he had to reach back before the 20th century to find anything that he might consider an example of that. And uh, my own personal belief is that uh, those, you know, 75 million uh, Trump voters who uh, not, not all of them obviously were outraged by the uh, election. Uh, a couple of thousand of them were outraged enough to go to Washington one day. Most of them are now facing federal trials. One of the leaders of the group, uh, so-called Oath Keeper leader, who said before, before January 6th, as you report, we've descended into civil war. He said that in December. He's in federal custody tonight. Uh, I, I personally just don't see anything that leads to the tinder in this country that could create anything that we would call civil war. I, I think you're right, you know, and I think there's two ways of looking at this, aren't there? Like, I think the authors that you've been speaking to, I think, have written very interesting books and they've done a good service in, in sparking this conversation. But in a way, what happens is that you, with those kind of books, you, you imagine yourself in the future and you look back on the present and say, if there were a civil war, would the president look like the conditions that created it? Right? And I think that's absolutely right. You know, it, it, there's no doubt about the fact that the tribalism, the violent rhetoric, the fact that the Republican Party has has become a kind of post-democratic party in, in a lot of ways. The, the problems that, that you, you, you've alluded to with the American Constitution, with the Senate, you know, the, the structural problems of American democracy, all of those things if you ended up with a horrific civil war in the future, you, historians would look back and say, well, y yes, those were the conditions that created it. But that's not the same as looking at things as they are now and looking at the, absolutely the, the, the huge threats and, 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 and the urgent need to, to really you know, take very seriously the, 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 the existence of American democracy. It, it, you must do that, but also look at the fact that, that the, the real task is to uh, stop the the insurrectionist movement which is there you know and you do that lawfully you do that through the process of law by by making people accountable for what was an attempted coup in america you know and actually talking about civil war those people are very happy to hear that, you know, because from their point of view, if they end up as martyrs and if they end up behind bars, they can say, well, you know, I was acting on behalf of people who were threatened with civil war by the other side. And it's a sort of it's part of this kind of self-justifying self-pity that a lot of these people have. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right that it's much more important to focus on where are we now, what needs to happen right now and in the next few years in order to change the conditions uh, that do threaten American democracy. 
It is Thursday, the 27th of January of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Well, speaking of spice... Uh, Stephen Breyer is stepping down, as you all know. <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> well, I suppose if you were indifferent, I don't think that this audience is any of that. And we must remember the great Eli Wiesel quote. The opposite of love is not hatred, but indifference. So we are anything but indifferent. And uh, Stephen Breyer is uh, stepping down. Now, we haven't heard an actual official declaration of that now, have we? I do know that Joe and uh, Stephen will be at the uh, White House today together. And I presume an announcement will be made if it hasn't already. Regardless, um, I would doubt very much that this word would not be getting out. Or how, how shall I phrase this? Uh, this wouldn't be uh, disseminated, leaked, you know, unless there was an official announcement set to come. And why not rattle the cage of all those Nazis over there in the GOP? Because that's what they are. All right? Am I being hyperbolic? Maybe. Maybe. But um, I think Vinton O'Toole might say that I would be overstating things since, you know, he was there for the troubles. I understand. Compared to what you guys went through, and you never called it a civil war because you were occupied. Get it? I'm sorry. Can't have a civil war. If you're occupied by a foreign power. And that other foreign power that's occupied your country does not yet make that then a united country and makes it then a civil war. I'm just, you know, I, I know he's a scholar and I'm just uh, the son of a scholar. <sighs> well, I had scholarly ambitions. Carried it over into the real world, as they say, and look where it got me. <laughs> death threats well I had that before too I had that even before I had a driver's license long before not me personally but uh, you know uh, the old parents there how dare you start an ACLU chapter in the San Gabriel Valley when we've got you know the Nazi party there in Hacienda Heights and then we got the Birchers over there in Diamond Bar mm -hmm. had a few cross burnings out of that experience was nice thought it was normal <laughs> no i didn't but let's put it this way when you see something that like that as a kid uh, you're, you, you, you don't really let it bother you again mm -hmm. it's not as if we didn't pay it any heed but we didn't let it have power over us and you know having the cops investigate kind of shuts people up too oh you mean they know how to respond okay wasn't just the cops, but still. Anyway, why do I call the GOP Nazis? Because they are. How dare the Tennessee GOP get rid of Mouse? I sat my son on my knee and read him that book when he was just a, well, more than a toddler. Before, long before he started school, though. Let's just put it that way, all right? What better way to teach children and high schoolers, because it is a graphic novel after all, the history of the Holocaust, the emotions behind it, and yes, the Nazis had accomplices. Mouse touched upon it all. But I guess there's like, you know, seven or eight curse words in there. And the worst one being, God damn, the pusher man. Yeah, God damn. 
as if nobody in a household anywhere in America, let alone the South, has ever used that term in front of their kids. When you have F Biden, I'm not talking just the F, but you got the UCK in there also. There's no let's go Brandon flags. We're talking F-U-C-K Biden. Flying on right, right by the elementary school here in town. The kids got to walk past it. Their buses go right past it. But use the word, Lord's word, name in vain, and that's a, that's a bridge too far, God damn it. See what, how that works? No idea of the founder's original intent in using God damn in the context of the novel. What motivated the, the utterance? Because that kind of critical thinking is absent in the Nazi mind. And if not, then it's willful ignorance or it's used against you and weaponized and then you're strung up and maybe, maybe you live before going to the camps. Maybe. So how dare they? If that's the way they're going to be, they're going to start burning books. We're not talking Texas DJs out there burning Beatles albums. That was bad enough. What's next? You ban Mouse, now you're going to ban uh, the rise and fall of the Third Reich and the banality of evil? Is that what is next? Damn right. There might be a curse word in there. There might be pictures of nudes. Nudity. Yeah, I love what they consider to be nude mice. Jesus, these people. And I use that as a way of dehumanizing them, okay? Because they're not part of us. They're not part of this earthly paradise that we're supposed to be living on. They've made it into a hellscape. I refuse to be a good neighbor, and you're not going to force me to be one either. You're so politically correct. You can't force me to be a good neighbor. Now it's woke. I refuse to be woke because I'm not going to be a good neighbor. I refuse to be a good neighbor. No, you, I'm not woke. Yeah, no shit you're not woke. All right. And they called us the hippies, the lazy hippies. Oh, the hippies are going to destroy America. Look what they've done. Yeah, equality. Cleaning up the rivers in the air. Getting plastic and pampers out of the surf. I hated surfing and pampers. Wouldn't anybody? Jeez. Yeah. We were the bad ones. We were the ones that had to be kicked. Well, you have empathy for your fellow person, human? We have to kick you. That's an alien. That's, that's a virus from outer space. Intent, I don't know, on using some sort of weird symbiotic relationship to, to destroy the host. Or is that parasitical? Damn it. Is this what we envisioned in our old age? I thought we were going to have like just like arguments about the quality and value of our 401ks if there's any of that left. Jeez. Now we got to figure out, well, I don't know. Do I pack up and try to get on a boat elsewhere? No one will have us. Oh, you come from the United States? You're not coming here. You're infected with a disease. I No, no, no. I've been totally vaxxed. We're not talking about that. Got the disease of ignorance, pal. They don't ever say pal over there. But, you know, I mean, if, if they had the uh, American lingo down, they might. Nope. We'll be turned away at the dock. Sent back out to sea, maybe have to come right back here. 
All those jokes about the gated communities and all we had to do was turn the guard shacks around and keep them there, they'd be totally happy. They got their strip mall Botox clinics. They got their fake uh, gated community lakes with their little fake gated community water feature in the middle of it. Rimmed by their not quite so fake uh, little marinas. And now we get the icebox baby gulags. We don't even we don't even get the gated community treatment. We're willing to give them the gated uh, community treatment, uh, you know, as as our way of keeping them in check. You know, kind of re-educating them. Actually, we're not re-educating. We're just letting them be, which might be worse. Jeez, looks what happens in the supermax prisons, as if. Uh, the ideology of white supremacy is tempered there. Gee, oh my God. No, we'd be right in the icebox, baby gulags. Wouldn't even be able to stand. Barely able to sit up. Hunched over, freezing to death. That's what we'll get. Okay, well, enough of that. Fenton O'Toole said that it's wrong for us to think there's a civil war. Well, yeah, okay, once again, you know, during the Troubles, I think it was, you know, the idea that uh, there was an occupied force called the English, the Brits. We've been a unified country since, well, you know, even before 1776. At least, if not before then, you know, officially in 1789. So come on. Let's get real here. And just because a bunch of slave-owning, commerce-minded ghouls who gave the fascists and the Nazis their ideas doesn't mean that we were, well, you know, a separated country, but that was a civil war. And I will say, only being the son of a scholar, mind you, that a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the sentiment that was directed at Abraham Lincoln and the idea of equal rights and due process for all, and the assassination and all of that, it's, uh, you know, resonating now. I'm just saying. Just saying. It's not coming from our side. Oh, yeah, Antifa is a cause of it. George Soros! It's a Jewish cartel with Jewish space lasers. They're going to, like, take all of our cryptocurrency away with their Jewish space lasers. Yeah, well, you know what? Your pyramid scheme is going to collapse on you. And we warned you. Don't listen to us. You think we're hippies. We're punks. And punks kick back. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> no, no, not enough of that. We need more of that, actually, you know. Uh, punch the Nazis before the Nazis burn your books and stab you in the back. They might even just stab you in the front. More likely. Okay. What's on the rest of the menu here? On this lovely Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, yes, yes, we do have a bit of peace and solace in the fact that it is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays because there is a little bit of jambalaya and a little bit of spice in your life. How about this spice? Here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, the Biden administration is boosting, boosting reproductive health protections in the face of all-out GOP attacks. Both U.S. senators from Connecticut were denied access to a federal prison while trying to examine conditions there in response to correctional officers' complaints. And the Los Angeles City Council approved a measure to ban new oil and gas wells and phase out the existing ones. After the break, we move to the chef's table where France has a new law that authorizes jail time for practitioners of conversion therapy. And European Union leaders are worried by the rise in anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
jacknetwoodsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page from that chat room link uh, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is also the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really helps us. And I, I, I hate the idea of always telling you that we're in dire need, but we are <laughs> because we're not Air America. Anyway, they never paid their bills. Okay. Never pay their people either, and neither do we, but uh, but we pay our bills, okay? And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, we're not union yet. We will be one day. I hope we can get big enough to do that. But our mission is mostly resisting the, uh, well, the dark forces uh, raid against the United States of America, domestic and foreign. And our civic duty is to continue that resistance. And that's why we need help from folks like you who have, incidentally, they can afford. And if you could afford an espresso type coffee drink and send those funds to us once a month, it really helps us in our in our strategy of paying our bills and flying under the radar. Also, it helps us put a, a dent in the continuous Maintenance and upgrading of the software and hardware. Planned obsolescence. Yeah, we're, we're going to need to have that discussion again. Anyway, uh, the world is what it is right now, and we have to live in it. And part of that is while well, paying our bills. And we've been able to fly under the radar for going on 11 years now because of folks like you who, uh, who have uh, helped us fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended. Oh, so many, many years ago. All kidding aside, thank you for your generosity and a little pre-thanks for uh, you know, your generosity in the future. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. You just go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then uh, get that posted up. Now, the show notes and links are quite important because, of course, we know that's where the re- re- real reportage can be, uh, well, at least found, you know, a way, the pathway to finding it. And I try to get that up uh, within that 10 minute period. And oftentimes it's during the opening clip. I apologize. If you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. And also the Deep Archive, because uh, uh, I'll give you a little bit of HIPAA information here, okay? Spreaker only allows us so many hours to have our, our show syndicated. Well, they get syndicated. But only so many hours to be up as a so, so-called archive. And so the bulk of all of these years' shows, of all the shows that have been on Netroots Radio, are archived at the Internet Archive, archive.org. And uh, links can be found to Netroot or to uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy specifically and uh, from there, I think that you're able to find the Netroots Radio team shows as well. So check it out. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the American Independent by Lisa Needham. As the GOP wages an all-out war against reproductive health rights, the Biden administration is taking steps to protect access to birth control and abortion. Most recently, the administration is pushing insurers to abide by the Affordable Care Act's birth control mandate. Mandate? Oh, I don't want to be told what to do. Yeah, well. The ACA requires insurers to cover 18 types of contraceptive methods without any cost sharing like a co-payment or deductible. The Guttmacher Institute, which tracks reproductive health legislation, explains that insurers can require restrictions within a method category 
In other words, to encourage patients to choose one hormonal IUD over another, but they may not favor one type of method over another, as in uh, oral contraceptives over contraceptive rings. It appears, however, that insurers have not necessarily adhered to this requirement. Several Democratic members of com- Congress namely the chairs of the House Committees on Energy and Commerce, Ways and Means, Education and Labor, and Oversight and Reform, first raised this issue in October of 2021. In a letter to Health and Human Services Secretary Xavier Becerra, Labor Secretary Martin Walsh, and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, the representatives informed the administration they had received reports of insurers denying birth control coverage in multiple ways, including insurers requiring people to try various forms of contraceptives before receiving coverage for their preferred method and refusing coverage for brand-name contraceptives when there was no generic option available. In December, Democratic Senators Patty Murray of Washington State and Ron Wyden of My Oregon provided additional information. Murray and Wyden told HHS that patients were required to show they had failed with as many as five, one, two, three, four, five different types of birth control before the insurer would cover the birth control method they desired. The administration has responded by issuing a fact letter to insurers reminding reminding them of their obligations under the ACA and telling insurers that the complaints are being actively investigated and that enforcement or other corrective actions could be taken. Looking forward, the administration says it also is considering whether to make changes to existing regulations to ensure complete coverage, such as making sure the FDA birth control guide includes all contraceptive products approved by the FDA since previous guidelines were issued in 2019. This guidance is in keeping with past commitments the administration has made toward ensuring full access to reproductive health services. Collins from the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Two U.S. senators said yesterday that they were denied access to parts of a federal prison in Connecticut while trying to examine conditions there in response to correctional officers' complaints about a staffing shortage and lack of coronavirus precautions. Concerns about the spread of COVID-19 itself were behind the denial, the Federal Bureau of Prisons said. How ironic. Senators Chris Murphy and Richard Blumenthal, both Connecticut Democrats, visited the Danbury Federal Correctional Institution with labor union leaders and two state lawmakers. Murphy said they were barred from seeing the main women's facility, but were able to see a men's unit after a, quote, fight to gain access. There was clearly a decision made to try to stop both of us from seeing some of the conditions at the prison, Murphy said during a news conference after the visit. This facility, even during COVID, should be open for inspection by policymakers, he said. We need to see it during good times, but we also need to see it during bad times. And if the Bureau of Prisons has decided that U.S. lawmakers are not going to be able to see what is really happening inside these prisons during a crisis, that's a problem. Hey, wasn't this movie uh, called Brubaker? 
Yeah, it was. Blumenthal said prison officials rejected at the last moment yesterday, Wednesday morning, an itinerary given to the senators ahead of the visit. The officials here said, we'd love to have you come back when COVID is over, Blumenthal said. Well, we came here to see conditions when COVID is the problem. That was the whole point. The Bureau of Prisons said in a statement that Murphy and Blumenthal were giving a tour of the prison based on current COVID-19 safety protocols. Oh, too bad you didn't have sufficient ones before they came to visit. The Bureau did not immediately respond to other questions about correctional officers' concerns about staffing and coronavirus protocols. A Bureau spokesperson said responses were being prepared. Oh, really? Prepared? The senators basically were kept away from areas where inmates were, said Sean Boylan, a Danbury prison staffer and executive vice president of the local prison staff union, Local 1661, of the American Federation of Government Employees. He said uh, prison officials had no objections to the original tour itinerary until Wednesday morning. The tour was changed to include include mostly empty areas, including a dining room for men and secure areas just outside the housing units, Boylan said. The Danbury Prison Complex houses 1,078 inmates. Murphy and the local correctional officers union say about 40% of the inmates are in isolation or quarantine because of the coronavirus. Part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Drew Costley out of the Associated Press. The Los Angeles City Council yesterday, Wednesday, approved a measure to ban new oil and gas wells and phase out existing ones. The council directed the city attorney to draft an ordinance to prohibit oil and gas drilling in Los Angeles, changing zoning laws to make drilling illegal and study how to legally phase out existing wells. The council also created a jobs program to transition oil and gas workers to other industries. Wow, I did that decades ago. The decision comes after a decade of complaints from residents about health problems, nosebleeds, wheezing, coughing. They blamed on air pollution from the sites. Activists say that black and Latino residents of the city are the most affected by the pollution from the sites. The city of Los Angeles becomes the third government entity in the county to approve a ban uh, and phase out of oil and gas. Culver City and unincorporated parts of Los Angeles County have taken similar steps. Representatives for the oil and gas industry groups oppose these types of measures, saying they would raise gas prices, eliminate jobs, and make the region more dependent on foreign oil. Well, that's not how it works. All right. We get all of our gas here that we pump through our cars and other engines in the international spot market. You don't get any of that oil, okay? It goes into a big kitty. And then you pay for it accordingly. All right? Please. They always try to throw this roadblock. Oh, well, you, 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 you are going to have such high gas prices when you do this. Anyway, I got to tell you a little secret. 
the oil they're getting out of there now is so sulfurated that they have to make it into plastics and other things that's not going into your engine. They're not refining sweet oil. They're refining sulfurated oil. There's a big difference. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Offshore wind in the U.S. is poised for a boom. States from Rhode Island on down to Virginia all have plans to ramp up offshore wind over the next decade. And the Biden administration has pledged to add 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. It's all part of an energy overhaul that aims to swap fossil fuels for renewables, reining in climate change and protecting our planet. Curbing climate change is one of the best things we can do to protect marine species. But harnessing the wind to blow back emissions is not without its own impacts. Of special concern are these denizens of the sea. That's a North Atlantic right whale recorded off the coast of Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. North Atlantic right whales migrate and feed along the U.S. East Coast, which is also ground zero for the U.S.'s growing offshore wind industry. Scientific American Custom Media spoke with oceanographer Joe Brody. He's part of a team trying to figure out how to avoid conflicts between wind turbines and whales. After a few years as a flight attendant, he left the friendly skies for the sea. Now he's the offshore wind research lead at the Rutgers Center for Ocean Observing Leadership. Joe, the North Atlantic right whale is one of the world's most endangered species. Only about 400 of them are left. Can offshore wind development along the East Coast coexist with right whales? And if so, how? I think the answer is definitely. The two can coexist. It just has to be done intelligently and with as much information as possible. The idea is, I guess a good way to put it in a term that we used to use at the airline was situational awareness. Knowing what's out there, when it's out there, where they are, and what they're doing is going to make all the difference. So you're part of a project funded by the offshore wind company Ersted and their ocean wind project partners in New Jersey that uses acoustic monitoring to track and study whales. It's called the Ecosystem and Passive Acoustic Monitoring Project. What does that project aim to do and who's involved? It is a partnership between Ersted and then us here at Rutgers University along with a team at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, led by Mark Baumgartner, and then another team at the University of Rhode Island, led by Dr. Jim Miller. What we're trying to do is use acoustic sensors that are deployed on a variety of platforms, such as stationary buoys, and then also underwater robots, gliders that can move through the water to listen for vocalizing right whales. And so the idea is, can you better monitor the presence or absence of the North Atlantic right whale by listening to them using autonomous sensors. Well, tell us a little about the technology you're using. What tools do you use to read the ocean and what kinds of data do they give you? So Mark Baumgartner at at Woods Hole, he deployed a buoy off the coast of New Jersey here, and he also deployed a buoy off of Massachusetts. And then the team at Rhode Island has another buoy that's more of like a test platform, trying out some advanced sensors that can help you triangulate the location The buoy is really just there to have the radio transmitters and things like that on up at the surface. So on the mooring itself at the bottom of the water column, that's where his sensor, which is called a DEMON, a digital acoustic monitoring instrument. It's basically a big anchor that has got this digital sensor on it. And it's soundproofed and insulated so that the flow of the water doesn't interfere with the listening tool. So that's another challenge is they've got to install things that reduce that. And there's all sorts of technology at play to really isolate the sound so that you can really hear very well. On the glider side, so it looks like a torpedo, but it doesn't actually have a propeller on it. And so what it does is it goes up and down over and over again. And it's a mobile platform, right? So you can explore the entire area. You're not restricted to just that one spot where the buoy is located. As offshore wind companies and scientists in the U.S. explore ways to protect biodiversity around turbines, 
They're taking a cue from Europe, where the wind industry is much more mature. Victoria Todd is the director and chief scientist for Ocean Science Consulting in Dunbar, Scotland. And for years, she's worked with companies and regulators to minimize the impacts of offshore energy projects on marine wildlife. The science shows that climate change is one of the biggest threats to ocean health. Expanding offshore wind is seen as key to the energy transition and reducing the effects of warming on marine wildlife. But while we know wind is an important part of the solution, we also know that offshore wind development is not harmless. The best way to protect marine life, in my opinion, is advanced planning. Perform baseline studies prior to the wind farm development such that we can understand the use of the area by the various animals at different times of the year. In addition, one can also use uh, pingers, which are actively producing noise-emitting devices that can send out a warning signal to the marine mammals, theoretically to pre-warn the animals that there is going to be a noise-emitting event about to happen and that they can perhaps vacate the area. Well, what would you say the U.S. can learn from Europe as we expand offshore wind development here? Well, I think from what I've seen so far, they're managing to do quite a good job of the planning elements of it. We have obviously very, very good research institutes on the East Coast. I used to be at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is a very experienced and competent and long-standing marine institute. And we have some great universities and some of the large whale experts. But they are also seeking our advice for these projects as well. In putting their heads together, scientists and offshore wind companies hope to make watching out for whales and other marine wildlife part of the industry's MO as turbines multiply off the U.S. coastline. That's good for the whales and good for the climate. One of the reasons we want renewable energy is we're trying to reduce the impact we're having on the climate. We're trying to reduce ocean acidification. We're trying to do all these things that are ultimately to protect our environment. But you don't want to damage the environment in the process, right? And so you have to preserve what you have while you're trying to prevent further damage. And so it's in everybody's best interest to make sure that it's done the right way. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. You are listening to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The American colonists labeled acts of parliament aimed at raising revenue and asserting control over the colonies intolerable acts or coercive acts. Colonists formed committees of correspondence to publicize colonial opposition and coordinate resistance. In the fall of 1774, each colony, except Georgia, sent representatives to a meeting in Philadelphia to decide the best response to the actions of the British government. The meeting was called the First Continental Congress. Some delegates urged reconciliation with Britain. Others contended that relations with Britain were already severed and a new system of government should be created. The delegates to the First Continental Congress adopted the Articles of Association, under which colonies agreed to boycott British goods. Their goal was to force Great Britain to change its policies, but British officials considered the trade ban an irresponsible defiance of authority and ordered the arrest of some of the leading colonists in Massachusetts. That's all for today's episode, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. 
On this day in labor history, the year was 1850. Renowned labor leader Samuel Gompers was born to a Jewish family in London, England. His family emigrated to the United States in 1863, where Gompers learned the cigar-making trade from his father. At the age of 14, he joined and became involved in the Cigar Makers International Union, Local 144, eventually ascending to president. Gompers became a leader in the U.S. labor movement when he helped found the American Federation of Labor. He was the AFL's longest-serving president from 1886 to 1890. And again from 1895 until his death in 1924. Under his leadership, AFL membership rose from 50,000 to nearly 3 million. The AFL was primarily made up of craft unions, locals that represented specific skilled trades. Gompers promoted harmony among the different craft unions that comprised the AFL, trying to minimize jurisdictional battles. This philosophy of trade or craft unionism often put the AFL at odds with the Knights of Labor and the industrial workers of the world. Those two large labor groups advocated for a strategy of one big union, organizing unskilled workers and forming community-based unions. Gompers promoted organizing and collective bargaining to secure shorter hours and higher wages. The first essential steps he believed to emancipating labor. He also believed that to be successful, working people had to engage in politics. The AFL supported labor-friendly candidates for political office. Under his leadership, the AFL and labor became an important political force. In 1955, the AFL merged with the Congress of Industrial Organizations to form the AFL-CIO. Gompers is frequently remembered for answering the question, what does labor want? We want more schoolhouses and less jails, more books and less guns, more learning and less vice, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge. We want more opportunities to cultivate our better natures. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 25 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of around 50. Sunny conditions should prevail, though right at this very moment it is just getting sunny. (laughs) And uh, as I mentioned, winds will be light and variable for the day. Clear skies overnight with lows once again in the low to mid-20s. And winds will remain light and variable. Tomorrow we'll have a sunshine or a day of sunshine and clouds mixed with a high of around 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County continue to increase. We now stand at 366,075 confirmed cases and our deceased has again increased, this time by two. And we now stand at 427. Pollen is rated as none right outside the window here in Rogue River proper. So that's some good news. And the air quality index is good for the region at 31 parts per million. So that's sort of good news. And that daytime UV index is low at level two. Even more good news in spite of the deaths and infections of an insidious disease that a lot of people around here don't care to take any precautions over. Back to the matter at hand. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.32 inches. Visibility is up to 8 miles and relative humidity is at 85%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd. Crowdsources from around the world. London is 53 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 50, or I'm sorry, Paris is 45 and cloudy. Rome is 56 and fair. Kiev is 31 with light snow. Kabul is 21 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 63 and fair. Tokyo is 43 and cloudy. 
Sydney, Australia is 75 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 45 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 25 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. France has a new law that bans so-called conversion therapies and authorizes jail time and fines for practitioners who use the scientifically discredited practice to attempt to change the sexual orientation or gender identity of LGBTQ people. The National Assembly approved the new law unanimously, voting 142 on Tuesday evening. The legislation includes criminal penalties for people who are convicted of trying to convert LGBTQ people to heterosexuality or traditional gender expectations. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Samuel Petroquin of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. European Union leaders pledged yesterday, Wednesday, to confront the rise of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial witnessed during the coronavirus pandemic on the eve of the annual commemorations of Auschwitz's liberation. European Council President Charles Michel said the lessons of the Holocaust are now more relevant than ever. First, because Jewish people feel threatened, and they are threatened, he said. They are even attacked in Europe just because they are Jewish. We do not accept this. We will never accept it. Michelle spoke on at an online event organized by the European Jewish Congress, which was also attended by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and European Parliament President, President, President Roberta Metzola. The Commission, the EU's executive branch, presented last year a new strategy to better tackle hate speech, raise awareness about Jewish life, protect places of worship, and ensure that the Holocaust is not forgotten. According to Europe's Fundamental Rights Agency, 9 out of 10 Jews think anti-Semitism has increased in their country and is a serious problem. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert 
Et d'un tel et d'éthéen Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à d'un divin Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère D'un manche à d'un divin Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 